Well, good evening once again and welcome to another edition of Beverly's Times Past. Ed Joseph's here with our very special guest once again this evening, Mr. Harold Boothroyd and Mr. Richard Sims, both of them uh, caretakers of two very fine collections of photographs. Harold, uh, you work out of the Wenham Historical Society and Museum and have dealt with the Benjamin Conant collection for the past 20 seven or so years right. and it's just a wonderful magnificent collection and Richard you are at the Beverly Historical Society uh, curating the um, Walker collection Lawrence right. Street Walker yeah, that's a right. plus now. yeah yeah <laughs> which has really blossomed out yeah. into yeah. more than perhaps uh, you had imagined it might, might yeah. become in the very beginning mm -hmm. and in our first program gentlemen we dealt with the early history of the railroad the steam engine railroad era here in the Beverly er area Rich can you kind of highlight some of the things we might have uh, seen on that program and we'll just get right into our new collection as soon sure. as we take a little review right here. we essentially covered the highlights of, of how the railroad came to the area which was around 1839 1840 was the Eastern Railroad building from Boston out to Portsmouth uh, through Beverly and Ipswich Newburyport and then later on uh, down to Gloucester and then eventually to Rockport uh, forming the Gloucester branch uh, the Eastern Railroad was taken over by the Boston and Maine in 1884 and has been the Boston and Maine until uh, fairly recent years when it was bought out by the uh, Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. And in the first program we covered quite a few photographs from the early days. Uh, obviously the 1830-40 period there were no photographs because there were no cameras. So we picked it up uh, essentially in the time of the 1880s, 1890s. And we covered the, uh, the areas of Beverly where there were stations, uh, Beverly proper, starting out with the Congress Street Station and then moving to the present station uh, where it's still located, and uh, North Beverly and Prides, Montserrat, Beverly Farms on the Gloucester Branch. And uh, we concentrated also some uh, pictures of the United Shoe, the construction of it and uh, some of the early days of carrying employees in and out of the shoe by train. And uh, at that point, uh, other than a few miscellaneous pictures, we had to call it quits. Mm -hmm. You get an A-plus for that review, my friend. That's right. excellent. <laughs> Would you like to add anything, Harold, to what, we, okay. what, what Dick said? Well, I, th I, think, I think he summed it up very nice. He sure, uh, sure and, he did. Uh, uh, for the people of uh, Beverly particularly, I think one of the interesting shots was the, the various shots at Gloucester Crossing. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. How it changed so from yes. the 1911 yeah. photograph yeah. Uh, just 15 years later on right. as we saw the pictures and are seeing them once again here. Right. Well, we're going to jump right into our, our collection, <coughs> fellas, because we have a ways to go. Hmm. And uh, uh, we, did, uh, we did some, of course, in the first program, but with, with the pilots in front of us, we get right to them. And we left off in 1937 about that time uh, and the next picture that was coming along was the uh, one showing the train the engine at the Federal Street turntable Harold uh, in April of 1937 mm -hmm. what was a turntable you tell us what that was <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a turntable uh, in the simplest form which is the one that was uh, near the Federal Street was a device which could turn the locomotive around 180 degrees mm -hmm. and uh, one of the essential uh, features of a turntable where they're manually turned uh, you had to get absolute balance of your locomotive on the pivot point of the of the table and once you uh, 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 once the engineer got the perfect place then didn't take more than one man to turn the thing around isn't that something yeah that's he right. had quite a quite a radius. Uh, you can see uh, some of the uh, bars there yeah. that that the guy pushes against. Yeah. Now these these engines could go in reverse, but it wasn't feasible to run them in uh, that way. Well, I, I don't think you, you you don't get you know best visibility by sure. running them in reverse. Sure. We do have a, sh a couple coming up, but I don't know how long they stayed in the the reverse uh, mode. Right. before they were turned around. I'm sure it was a, a short period of time because I, I don't think the engineers felt too comfortable sure. uh, running that way. 
Harold, exactly where was this turntable located? Just as we go under the underpass? On, on no, it, it, was, it was north of just where you go under the underpass. Okay, all right. Yeah. Mm, Stanton Engineering is, in yes. the, is, is actually I th I the, think the, cellar, right the cellar hole is the turntable pit, yeah. okay. actually. Maybe yes. we'll get a picture of that. I think that might be nice. You can actually see the round edge of it next sure. to the building. Okay. I think it's also uh, interesting to note that uh, I think uh, quite a bit after uh, 1870, 1872, that practically all the station areas, at, at least within one or two from one another, had a turntable. It was. Uh, I know they had, they had one in uh, uh, in in Wenham, Hamilton uh, they did. area. And one in Salem. Yeah, one in Salem. Uh, one in Lynn. Yeah, it, it went right on. The bigger they were, and then they got uh, motorized. You know, in the in the large one, larger ones. Where yeah. You, 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 there was a gearing all around, a, a, a big ring gear, yep. and and uh, the guy would start the motor, and it and he'd. he'd run the thing around, and, and there was a pinion that just walked around yeah. and r ran the table. Easier than it, than it looked. To oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, again, <laughs> they were on a balance point, and that's how when they were done manually, and those, by the way, they used to call them jokingly Armstrong turntables <laughs> uh, when they were manually operated. Yeah. And then they, they came up with an air-operated motor, which was much like a little one-cylinder steam engine, and they would actually hook up the air brake line of the locomotive to this little one-cylinder air engine and there was usually a shack on one end of this thing and a little controller handle and the man would get in there and open the valve and this thing would go and the turntable would turn around. Okay, a snow train special passes through North Beverly in January of 1938, Rich. Looks like a double header. That is a double header and that's another Ted Day special and uh, he was lucky to get what he did because again with his uh, primitive uh, brownie camera at the time I'm assuming by the looks of the smoke laying flat back over this train here that they were probably rolling along at about 45 miles an hour or more. Good stop action here. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And these snow trains were, were run by the Boston and Maine Railroad. Now, the whole idea was to take skiers up to the, to the slopes in North Conway mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. uh, in that area. And the Boston and Maine actually should be credited with making the ski industry in New Hampshire what it is today. Because until then... Uh, winter sports in, in the North Country was limited to what few people could get up there on their own. And the Boston and Maine said, hey, why don't we run whole trains up there and people can go skiing and snowshoeing, which was a big thing in those days, and uh, not have to worry about driving up on those primitive roads back in the, in the teens and 20s. Oh, yeah, I, th I think they probably offered a special rate, too. Oh, it was, yeah. yeah which, which made it more attractive to... And, mm -hmm. and it would run weekends, uh, right. and, and uh, I, I remember my wife went uh, yeah. on, on one of the trains up to, to yeah. New Hampshire. But this was a business venture, though. For oh, it absolutely. It, it was a promotional uh, thing, was from, yeah, too. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it, it, it did a lot of advertising for the, for the railroad. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm thinking of your story of how some of the trolley systems uh, literally built the, the, the parks, such as Salem Willows. Mm -hmm. and, Canopy Lake. Canopy Lake, mm -hmm. just to mm -hmm. get the business. Sure, it was, it was definitely a promotional thing, and the railroad really pushed it. I mean, there were ads everywhere, uh, you know, back in that era mm. uh, for the snow trains. Sure. Timetables showed it, yep. yeah, and yep. big pictures. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, North Beverly Depot, next to the freight house siding, Rich, eastbound prior to 1939. Yeah, this is uh, one of the Pacific-type engines. We're getting bigger now, and this is number 3603, and it's one of the first, in fact, it's the third of the Pacific types on the Boston and Maine Railroad, which began to come uh, on the line in 1910. And uh, these engines had a remarkably long life, uh, most of them uh, coming as they did in, in the 1910, 11, and 12 period, and a lot of them lasted up until the very end of steam on the railroad, which was 1955 mm -hmm. and 56. Mm -hmm. So they had a 46-year life, some of them, mm. and I think that's pretty remarkable when you consider the short life of, of diesels today. Sure, sure is. Um, the other thing that's, that's interesting about this picture is the siding in the background with a little freight house that shows just up over the top of the engine there. Mm. For many years, uh, H.P. Hood and Sons uh, took grain and hay delivery there. Uh, they'd unload boxcars onto flatbed trucks, and they'd truck that stuff up to Cherry Hill Farm. Uh, because they did not have sufficient land area at Cherry Hill to uh, 
grow enough fodder for the, for the herd that was kept there, and they'd have to bring it in uh, by train. So for many years, grain and, and baled hay was unloaded at that particular siding. Hmm. Harold, anything to add here? No, I, I, I guess he covered you pretty covered well. It all. Okay. You now in the next picture, it looks like we may well be seeing the same freight shed here, Rich. Uh, yeah, you get a good shot of it looking in from Dodge's Row Crossing. Uh, it was a little building, probably about uh, oh, 10 or 12 feet wide by maybe 14 feet long. Essentially a one-room building with a large door on one side and a little platform on the end and a special side track which came in from the north end. And uh, they'd usually have a couple of, of cars parked in there at any particular time. And uh, goods that would be damaged by being outdoors were offloaded into that freight shed until somebody could come down and pick them up and uh, non-perishable material would be just unloaded on the platform. Right. This is dated 1939, Harold. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the, uh, the directional run here, now, they always ran on the right-hand side, right? They, just they like you drive. Mm, uh, same mm -hmm. as an automobile. Mm -hmm. This yeah. was the code of the, yeah. tr of the yeah. railroad, too. In inbound to Boston was, uh, in this direction, was the, uh, the right-hand side. The way he's yeah. going here, yeah. yeah. Okay. And only on special occasions, as we witnessed in that earlier Taft picture. Yeah, that was kind of weird. They might, uh, 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 the only other thing that came to my mind is that they they uh, they, they might have come down, and then they were they wanted to back Run back around. the other way, yep. mm -hmm. right from. In other words, they stopped at Montserrat. And instead of turning the locomotive around because there was no turntable at Montserrat, it crossed over. They, they, yeah. It's hard to say with a yeah. move like that because yeah, yeah, it's so special. You just don't know. Yeah, you don't right. know. Now, Harold, next we have a United Shoe Machinery evening passenger train at the Bass River siding dated 1939. Not one of your photos, but nonetheless of your era when you right. were taking this them. Right. Uh, this is a, f a friend of mine who lives in Florida now. Uh, had a box camera, and he used to kind of follow around with this uh, and t take a few shots. This is one of the ones he took. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting. It was under power, and uh, rods down, which is supposed to be uh, the, the way you photograph locomotives. And this this is, train has just come out of the United Shoe and probably got the passengers heading into Beverly Station. Now, it, it they. they they go to Salem and, and probably right to Boston, uh, depending on where the people come from. The people that want to go in the Gloucester Branch can get off at Beverly and pick up a, a train going to the Gloucester Branch. Uh -huh. So uh, it was it's kind of a little commuter thing, uh, and, and it served the United Shoe Machinery Corporation without having everybody drive their own car in. All right. Now the next picture up is one of yours. Uh, with the HWB logo down at the bottom yeah. here, and we have a winter of 39, 1939 here uh, photograph. Yeah, this is this is this was a cold day as I remember, and uh, they they all wanted to come out and pose, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't have the the foresight site back then to to get all their names and and but I the the second one in from the left I I did know it was. Edgar Gilman, he was a, a trainman or a brakeman at that time uh -huh. on a passenger. I guess it's a trainman on a passenger. It could mm -hmm. be a brakeman on a freight. freight. Same difference. Yeah. Yes. yeah, but they basically had <coughs> the same job. I bet all these guys knew Harold though, Rich, don't no, you? No, probably because <laughs> anyone that, that took pictures like that, that was soon became, a, yeah, soon became you know, well known yeah. to train crews. And this was a morning picture and this was heading uh, towards the Belly Station. Okay. Yeah. At this point, Harold, I'd like to have you uh, take that camera that we I see down there oh, on the, the table yeah. and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what, what that is about, because this is the infamous camera that did all of the photographing here that we're I, I started uh, with a camera that my mother had, and she had a bellows camera, but it had a very small lens, uh, and so it wasn't too much better than a box camera. Uh -huh. And uh, the bellows uh, started developing.